there is a protocol designed for poor responder with the uses of letrozole of course which is banned in india so instead of letrozole anestrozole can be tried in this protocol the letrozole 5 mg it comes in 2.5 mg tablet so 5 mg one tablet 12 hourly from day 2 to day 6 to be given so it takes the advantage of natural raised fsh in the initial phase of the follicular stimulation in it adds the value uh, of to the stimulation uh, in addition to the hmg which is to be started in higher dose 600 international unit from day 5 daily follicular monitoring to be done and antagonist to be started when the correct criteria to start antagonist are met which we have already discussed couple of times in the previous talk the trigger to be given when more than two follicles are more than 20 mm it was observed in poor responder the combination of the letrozole and gonadotropin economize the protocol cost without compromising the oocyte quality and results now coming to another protocol which is used for poor responder that is micro flare protocol this protocol gives equivalent result to a antagonist protocol for poor responder cases the rationale of this protocol is to take the advantage of initial flare without early rise of lh p4 androgens and that too without profound down regulation the ocp pre treatment is must to blunt the flare and cyst formation the oc pills to be started from day 2 and it has to be given minimum for 8 to 10 days after 2 days of stopping oc pills lupiride 20 to 40 microgram 12 hourly to be started daily till the trigger uh to prepare a 20 to 40 microgram luprolide you have to use the insulin syringe which contains 100 unit in 1 ml so accordingly you can titrate the dose and you can inject the gonadotropin preferably pure fsh or recombinant fsh in the early part of the stimulation at higher dose to be started from the third day of agonist and switch over to hmg when the lead follicle are around 10 to 12 mm it has been proved that for the prevention of ls surge such a small dose of agonist is sufficient so it gives both the advantage it prevents too much suppression it prevents ls surge also it helps in the initial flare so natural gonadotropins are secreted the trigger is to be given by scg when the criteria are met there is one another protocol described which is also for poor responder in which little modification of flare is given like ocp in the original study they used the ocp 
containing anti androgens like saprotiron acetate or drospirenone to start on day 2 to 5 at least for 7 days so ocp to be started from day to 5 and it has to be continued at least 7 days 8 days 10 days the agonist in the original trial they use triptorelin 0.1 mg for 2 to 3 days after the stopping the pills for 3 days on the third day of the agonist the follicular stimulating hormone fsh 450 international unit to be started the agonist is given for 3 days only on the third day of agonist fsh to be started and antagonist added in a standard way when the criteria are met and the same day same time recombinant fsh is change over to hmg the trigger scg to be used in this protocol they found a good result the ocp helps in scheduling synchronization of the follicle and all the negative possible effects of ocp like high gonadotropin consumption endometrial receptivity problem low endogenous lh is not when anti androgenic ocpils were used ocpil suppresses the pre agonist fsh rise same time without blunting the flare but it blunts the lh flare preventing androgen and p rise in the early follicular stimulation that is a beauty of this protocol the agonist flare stimulates the early follicular endogenous fsh without rise in androgen and progesterone from the rescued corpus luteum so this was another modification when uh, the agonist was given a little higher dose but was given for 3 days only this protocol uses agonist as well as antagonist coming to a natural cycle protocol you all know that the first ivf conception was with the natural cycle it's a valid alternative in young poor responder but can also be used in older proto- older woman in which the scg trigger 10000 units given when the follicle lead follicle was more than 16 mm that goes a reasonable pregnancy rate around 10 to 15 15 to 15 percent around approximately but as far well, as far as the financial aspect is concerned this is not practical although the consumption of the gonadotropin is not there so that expenses are not there but the rest of all expenses are same like embryology charge lab charges uh, disposable media everything is same so it is not practically used anymore there is a protocol called modified natural cycle protocol in which the antagonist is to be started when the lead follicle is 15 mm along with that the indomethacin 50 mg vaginal three times or tablet ibuprofen 200 mg orally three times is started till scg to prevent a mechanical rupture in the same day of antagonist hmg 150 international unit 
to be started. Thinking that antagonist may inhibit the natural gonadotropin secretion, so this is added to take care of that. The SCG trigger to be given when the follicles were more than lead follicles, eighteen to nineteen millimeter. The ovum pickup is done thirty-four hours post trigger embryo transfer day two. Again, this is a not a cost effective protocol, but it's a reasonable treatment option for patient considering IVF, especially for those less than thirty-five years old with normal or poor urine response. Possibly for those more than thirty-six years old with normal urine response, and may even be considered as a first approach in this. patients recently many of the centers they practice a delayed start antagonist protocol for poor responder the poor response is to the follicular stimulation in poor responder may be due to shorten follicular phase With the limited ability to recruit sizable cohort, or it may be from differential sensitivity of early enter follicle to FSH. By incorporating E2 pre-treatment to a GnRH antagonist protocol, gain attention to lower endogenous luteal FSH secretion without suppressing the ovarian response. in the earlier studies the e2 pretreatment was shown to improve follicle synchronization and eventually resulted in more coordinated follicle development leading to a recovery of more mature oocytes however a substantial number of the patients still suffer from asynchronous follicular growth when you are using estrogen pretreatment before starting stimulation and likely to likely owing to a higher early follicular phase fsh level compared with down regulated protocol in this protocol delayed start antagonist protocol estrogen priming with the e to patch or tablet starting a week after the lh surge until the menses the baseline ultrasound on the completion of gnrh antagonist pretreatment in the delayed start protocol were performed to document absence of ovarian cyst or lead follicle more than 10 mm the ovarian stimulation was started after 7 days of gnrh antagonist pretreatment for stimulation 300 international unit fsh and 150 international unit hmg were used for ovarian stimulation the gonadotropin dose was maintained fixed throughout the whole stimulation period gnrh antagonist was added again in the later half of the cycle to prevent premature ovulation when the lead follicle measured more than 12 13 mm and was continued until scg trigger the final oocyte maturation was triggered with 10000 international unit scg when the largest two follicles attain a mean diameter of 18 mm with a general cohort of follicle more than 13 mm patients were allowed to proceed to a ocr if three or more follicles were in dominant range in case of fewer than three dominant follicle the cycle 
was cancelled and the intrauterine insemination was performed. If there were three or more dominant follicle, OCR was performed under TVS guidance 36 hours after SCG. The pretreatment with the GNRH antagonist for seven consecutive days before the onset of ovarian stimulation with the gonadotropin resulted in a more synchronous follicular growth, the higher mature oocyte yield and more embryos to transfer compared to the conventional estrogen priming protocol. A significant number of the women who had failed control ovarian stimulation owing to a poor response met the criteria to proceed to OCR with this subsequent delayed start protocol. This protocol is longer and the total cost is higher but it definitely gives a new hope to a poor responder. Now what are the adjuvants which can be added which can help in the implantation. Many centers use immunoglobulin. It is to be started 5 days before embryo transfer. The immunoglobulin is not easily available. We use injection Barglobe that is uh, manufactured by I think serum, uh, Bar Serum which is to be repeated every 21 days. The name is Bar Globe. Another adjuvant is a prednisolone tablet. It is to be started 10 mg with the starting of gonadotropin stimulation. Since it is a steroid, it increases IGF-2, so it will improve endometrial receptivity as well as it will improve the quality of the oocytes also. The low molecular weight heparin 40 units from the ovum pickup till 12 weeks of pregnancy is very commonly practiced most of the time empirically and there are the papers which have observed an improvised result in the absence of APLA syndrome if this is used empirically to improvise the implantation. Low dose aspirin 100 mg from the mid luteal phase with agonist and continued reduce the chances of OHS thromboembolic phenomena and it increases the clinical pregnancy rate. But there are some studies which found it unnecessary and there is study which showed that it reduces the pregnancy rate. So depending on your experience you can try and you can find out what works for you. Now we will discuss next time we will discuss the or maybe we can continue the FET uh, protocol uh, frozen embryo transfer protocols. The basically So why the best frozen embryo transfer protocol is required? Because worldwide 
there is increased trend of symbol embryo transfer and improvise vitrification forces us to optimize the endometrium for the better implantation the healthy embryo needs receptive endometrium for successful implantation it has been observed that in two third of the embryo transfer failure are due to lack of endometrial receptivity and remaining one third cases where embryo itself are responsible when you are measuring endometrial thickness it is to be measured the maximum distance between the echogenic interface of myometrium and the endometrium normally the endometrium grows at the rate of 0.5 mm per day in the proliferative phase and 0.1 mm per day in the luteal phase the thickness ranging from 9 mm to 14 mm has higher implantation and pregnancy rate compared to the endometrial thickness less than 7 to 8 mm when you are evaluating the endometrial pattern it has been described by grunfeld in a very simplified way the late proliferative or type a type 1 endometrial pattern where the hyperechoic endometrium is less than 50% of the thickness with hyperechoic basalis and hypoechoic functionalis this type of the endometrium we get when the endometrium is beautifully and efficiently estrogenized type 2 pattern is early secretory pattern where the endometrium is started exposing to progesterone in which the hyperechoic basalis and functionalis extend into more than 50% of the thickness and third is a mid or late secretory endometrium type 3 endometrium where it is fully exposed to progesterone in which there is homogeneous hyperechoic functionalis extending from the basalis to the lumen the grunfeld describe that type 3 endometrium at the trigger day correlated with low implantation and which suggested closure of the window of the implantation now what is this implantation window the normally implantation window in a supplemented cycle starts 48 hours after starting progesterone and it remains open for next 4 days for better implantation and development synchrony between endometrium and embryo is must the synchrony is defined when early embryo and endometrium are developing at the same pace and asynchrony when the difference of more than 2 days between endometrial histology dating and the actual day after the ovulation in frozen embryo transfer to avoid confusion always count the endometrial age and embryonic age in a this way 
the endometrial age is calculated as day 0 equal to day of ovulation or first exposure to progesterone in artificial cycle. Whereas the embryonic age is taken as day 0 equal to fertilization. For endometrial preparation, broadly three types of regimens are used. One is natural cycle with or without ovulation induction by SCG. Two, the artificial cycle using estrogen with or without agonist suppression. And third, a stimulated cycle. In natural cycle, it is feasible only for the woman with the regular menstruation and proven ovulation because the endocrine preparation of the endometrium is achieved by endogenous sex steroid production from a developing follicle. So when you are doing natural cycle third embryo transfer, you should start monitoring from cycle day 10 to 12. That is approximately 3 to 5 days prior to estimated ovulation day. You start doing serial ultrasonography which will tell you the endometrial thickness, follicular development and which will give some idea about when to start the commencement of testing for LH whether it is urinary LH or blood LH depending on the facilities available. You should be able to measure progesterone level also. When a rise in serum LH level is observed it is assumed that the ovulation will occur 36 to 40 hours later. If you are measuring with the urine LS surge, when the urine LS surge kit gives two line, that means surge is positive, each leg up to 21 hours behind the appearance of the surge in the blood. So means the LS, the ovulation is expected 36 to 40 hours after rise in serum LS level whereas in next 24 hours after urinary LS surge. The day when the LH exceeds 180% of baseline which corresponds to a day prior to ovum pickup or ovulation that means in next 24 hours the ovulation is expected. Now how to count a baseline LH? It is calculated as the mean of the three previous morning samples. After finding out the LS surge by serum level or urinary LH, you have to keep watch sonographically to find out the ovulation evidence. Once you found out the day and time of the ovulation, the frozen embryo transfer is performed 3 to 5 days after ovulation depending on the stage of embryo when it were those were frozen the day of ovulation corresponds to a day of ocr if the embryos were frozen at 72 hours the ovulation day plus 3 is the right time to transfer the disadvantage of natural cycle transfer that the regular menstruating 
woman may not have all the cycles ovulatory up to 20% of the cycles are anovulatory so it is difficult to transfer in such patients many time ls search finding is difficult a lot of intra cycle inter patient variation in the timing of occurrence of ls search in relation to ovulation the lh urine kit have large variation and up to 30% false negative results so those who are believing in natural cycle they have shifted to a modified natural cycle which is suitable for patients with the regular menses in which the monitoring of the follicle and lh starts from cycle day 10 If the follicle reaches 18 mm and endometrial thickness more than 8 mm E2 more than 150 picogram progesterone less than 1 nanogram without LH peak that means negative urinary LH or serum LH less than 20 international unit the SCG 10000 as a trigger to be given document the ovulation after 36 to 48 hours by transvaginal sonography suppose follicle is reach 18 mm with with lh peak document ovulation with tvs after 24 to 48 hours once you have documented ovulation day 3 embryo transferred 3 days after the ovulation and day 5 or 6 blastocyst transferred 5 days after the ovulation suppose the ovulation did not occur because of the luteinized and ruptured follicle the transfer the day 3 embryo 5 days after and 5 to 6 day 5 or 6 embryo 7 days after the ls search the luteal phase support in natural cycle is not required or you can say there is too little evidence supporting the positive effect of luteal phase support next time we will discuss the down regulated hrt cycle for frozen thaw embryo transfer thank you